The unsurpassed, penetrating, and perfect truth is seldom met with, even in a hundred thousand myriad kalpas. Now we can see and hear it. We can remember and accept it. I vow to make the Buddha's truth one with myself. Homage to the Buddha, homage to the Dharma, homage to the Sangha. When the king, named Universal Enfolder, heard the Buddha's teaching, he rejoiced as he never had before. He made a great lion's roar in the presence of the assembly, speaking in verse. Now in the presence of the entire assembly, I bring forth bodhicitta for the sake of all sentient beings. I vow to involve myself in samsara countless times to bring great boons to living beings until the end of the future. I shall cultivate all the bodhisattva's deeds to save living beings from their sufferings. From this moment on, if I break my vow and become greedy, miserly, or resentful, I shall be deceiving the Buddhas in the ten directions. From today, until the day I realize enlightenment, I shall always follow the Buddhas in cultivating pure conduct. I shall observe the pure precepts and commit no misdeeds. I shall not cherish the idea of realizing Buddhahood in haste. But until the end of the future shall benefit all living beings and adorn and purify incalculable, inconceivable Buddha lands. When the king, who was by then Manjusri Bodhisattva, had spoken this verse, the six kinds of quakes shook billions of Buddha lands in the ten directions. Musical instruments sounded in the air and flowers of the coral tree rained down, all because the king's vow was sincere. These verses are from our litany of Manjusri Bodhisattva, which we've taken from the the Maharatnakuta Sutra, which is a scripture that is a compilation of excerpts from many Mahayana Buddhist sutras, this one specifically from the Sutra of the Prediction of Manjusri's Attainment of Buddhahood. Manjusri means gentle glory or sweet splendor. Or when translated from the Chinese, it means wonderful auspiciousness, sometimes called the wonderful fortunate one. Not always what you might associate with wisdom, but he is indeed the bodhisattva of supreme wisdom, also known as the trainer of bodhisattvas. He is regarded as the foremost of all bodhisattvas in assisting the present Buddha Dharma, and therefore is also called the Dharma prince of the Buddha's realm. In Japanese, he's called Manju, in Chinese, Wen Shu Pusa or Wen Shu Shili, and in Korean, Mun Susari. I hope that's the right pronunciation. He is also known as Manju Gosha, which means the soft or gentle voiced Lord. Again, Manjusri appears in the triad of the three precious bodhisattvas along with Avalokiteshvara and Samantabhadra, because great wisdom and great compassion and great practice, great love, all have to go together. They work in harmony with each other. You can't have one successfully without the other. And this is always very important to remember when we're talking about these bodhisattvas. Without wisdom, compassion becomes foolish. And without compassion, wisdom becomes cold and hard. They have to flow together. But it can be helpful to look at them individually as well. 
Manjushri Bodhisattva is also, on, as I mentioned uh, yesterday, on Buddhist altars assisting Shakyamuni along with Samantabhadra Bodhisattva. And his Bodhi Mandala, the center of the faith of those who are his followers in particular, is Wutai Shan, his sacred mountain in Shanxi province in China. Manjushri Bodhisattva is usually shown as a beautiful young prince seated in his lotus blossom. Sometimes his body is golden. He's often seen riding a lion, sometimes blue-green in color. The lion being regarded king of beasts, symbolizing the quality of the complete taming of the passions by great wisdom, prajna paramita which Manjusri embodies. He carries the sword, sometimes a flaming sword, of Buddha's perfect wisdom in his right hand, which cuts through doubt and the darkness of ignorance of our true nature. Manjusri is also said to guard the sacred doctrine of the Buddha, and he seems to be in the sutras one of the main communicators of the Dharma. He appears in many of the Mahayana Buddhist sutras, including the Vimalakirti Nirdesa Sutra, um, which um, is about the teaching of a very renowned lay man at the time of the Buddha who was said to be a highly developed bodhisattva. And all of the Buddha's disciples and other bodhisattvas were too... um, shy to go and ask him questions. Manjushri was the only one who had the courage to go and um, have a dialogue with this layman bodhisattva. Manjushri's sword can represent anything that wakes us up to the Buddha's truth in our lives, the positive discipline of training. As you know, perhaps in the Chan and Zen Buddhist traditions, It was, and and still is customary in some temples, for a disciplinarian monk, or as we call them, an instructor, to carry a kyosak, which represents the sword of Buddha's wisdom, carrying it around the meditation hall during sitting periods to help keep the meditators awake and ease their tensions, is the idea. This monk is supposed to be a representative of Manjusri Bodhisattva in the hall, And when the person concerned has that attitude of mind and has developed his or her training to that point, it could be very helpful. Um, However, we, Reverend Master Jiu, as you know, stopped this practice of um, using the Kyosak here many, many years ago and felt it wasn't necessary anymore, um, partly because um, people were a little afraid of it in our culture, And um, so we had to learn to ease the tensions that arose in meditation ourselves and arouse the heart of of Manjusri within our own meditation practice. To me, Manjusri's sword has particularly represented the way in which meditation practice works. As we sit, by not trying to think and not trying not to think, By loosening our identity with emotions, sensations, desires, etc., all that arises. By sitting still with the mind's impulse to create opposites, to chase after this and that, or reject this and that. I found that a middle path is cut open. It's as if a jungle of our greeds and angers and confusions parts. And if you like, one of the images that comes to my mind is the the vines of the fetters are slashed away and uh, the middle way opens up. There's a striking to the core of that which is true, the wonderful and fortunate, ever fresh, ever new, immaculate, ever gentle in its spiritual strength. Manjusri's sword of meditation opens the door to our true heart. You may, um, we all have in our training times when 
training becomes a little dull perhaps or we're reciting the same scripture for the 250th time and we, you know, it just goes right through and we don't feel we're really paying attention to it. Um, and when uh, we feel we're not sure why we're doing it and so on. But as you also, most of you know, who've been keeping going for the, over the years, if you keep your meditation up, um, eventually this freshness will come into it and we see the scripture anew. <coughs> we see our relationships anew. We see the work before us in a new light. Certainly this is my experience and it has um, been a tremendous encouragement to me and has caused me to really have faith in and continue trusting the practice. In reality, given the law of impermanence, Anicca, nothing is ever the same anyway. This is what our minds tell us. In his left hand, Manjusri carries the Prajnaparamita Sutras, the scriptural teachings on great wisdom. Sometimes the sutra book is supported by a lotus flower, or he carries a lotus scepter, representing his spiritual authority to teach and train bodhisattvas. According to the Shurangama scripture, Manjusri became a Buddha immeasurable kalpas ago. That's a very long time. And even though he's an assistant to Shakyamuni Buddha in the present, he or she, as these are truly beyond the sexes in that sense, is said in many sutras and commentaries to have inspired countless Buddhas in the past, leading trainees to the fruit of the realization of Buddhahood. He is referred to as the mother or father, the parent of Buddhas in the three worlds of past, present, and future, in other words, of all sentient existence. In Soto Zen monasteries, there is traditionally a statue of Manju Bosatsu, Manjusri, on the monk's meditation hall altar. Reverend Master Ji, who taught that he sits at the center of the Bodhi Mandala in the meditation hall and watches and mothers the trainees until such time as they, through their vows of training to keep the precepts and their efforts in meditation and bowing and daily practice, until they are reborn into the Buddha's Dharma realm, which she also called the Sea of the Lotus. In this form, the bodhisattva appears as a simple monk sitting very still in meditation on a wild and somewhat crazed-looking beast. The beast is pacified, yet is looking up at the monk out of one eye, or the corner of an eye, with an interesting expression of both friendliness and sometimes almost adoration, as I see it, at the same time also a hint of mischief revealing its unpredictable nature. This image also has been a great inspiration to me at times when I really needed it. Manjusri has realized perfect wisdom going beyond the duality of training and enlightenment. Having tamed and befriended the beast of the small self, he never forgets the beast's wild nature, however, He doesn't let it worry him. I remember Reverend Master Jiu often cautioning her disciples that our old karma can still work on us even after deep religious understanding has occurred. So Manjusri teaches us to sit still in the midst of all conditions and not to try to get rid of or squash the self He doesn't have a choke chain on the beast, but to also not get caught up in its demands and respecting it as a friend, perhaps who keeps us on our toes in practice and ultimately helps us in walking the Noble Eightfold Path. Keeps us humble, always practicing humility and gentle mindfulness. This is my understanding. The beast can also be seen as the ways of the world, this Saha world, 
that we live in. Just as in the image of the lotus blossom, rooted in and nourished by the mud of samsara, of ignorance, yet rising above it into the light of truth. When preparing this talk the other day, I was thinking about an incident, a very small thing, um, a time many years ago when we had a dog called Sam, as many of you may have met, giant, big Dalmatian, and he was quite a character. And I had the job, I was one of Reverend Master G's assistants at the time, and one of my jobs was to take Sam for a walk once in a while around the property here. And Sam helped me to see a lot about this, this beast and how to, <laughs> how to train with this beast of self. Um, I, w I really had had no experience walking dogs, and um, you know, he had a collar on, and, and he was on a leash, and it was more like he, him taking me for a walk most of the time. And Reverend Master Jiu one day happened to observe me <laughs> doing this, um, and uh, I was trying to control him, trying to pull him away because he had a tendency to use just about anything uh, to relieve himself on. And um, I was trying to um, regulate that. And, um, uh, and, she's, and, um, and she said, um, just let him do it. Just let him, let him be. <laughs> let him pee, in other words. <laughs> and, um, of course, we were at a tree at that time. But it, that little incident taught me something about um, training with the beast. And I continued to work with Sam and actually came to befriend him. Um, there was always a little bit of a struggle with Sam, but I was, I was able to let go of the sense of needing to control him, at the same time still making sure that he, um, there was some restraint applied. So we became good friends, and just as an aside, I had the great privilege of doing his funeral when he did die at the Berkeley Priory many years later. And I give this just as a small example of how Reverend Master taught us, and really how most Buddhist teachers and you know, Zen masters teach their disciples. It's through these ordinary activities and daily life that wisdom, the Dharma, comes through. You know, there were, of course, lectures and there were readings of sutras and, and things like this. But so much of the teaching that I remember most um, occurred in those, those small instances. And, of course, in our daily lives, we don't have to have Reverend Master here to show us that. We have these opportunities arising all the time when the Master is pointing something out to us. And all we need to do is just learn to listen, learn to tune into that more. Going back to um, Manjushri's iconography, I'm told again that in, in Japanese scrolls, just uh, for your interest, Manju is also sometimes depicted, as is Samantabhadra, as a, young, as a woman, actually, not a young woman, in ordinary guise, sitting on a garden seat in the shape of a beast, again emphasizing the aspect of being the mother or parent of Buddhas. I thought that was interesting. Reverend Master Dias, we wrote in one of our, um, an invocation that he wrote for our Manjusri festival, he writes in one of the verses, within the meditation hall rides there a saint upon a beast. The two are one, their struggles ceased, for wisdom breaks desire's thrall. Of the four elements Manjusri is particularly associated with space. He shows us how to train as unsui, which is a Japanese term used for Zen Buddhist trainees, meaning clouds and water. As clouds and water move through earth and sky, not clinging to anything and not pushing anything away, so as trainees we travel the path cultivating the courage and the willingness to go on, go on, always going on, always becoming Buddha. The heart of Manjusri rises above and beyond all opposites, going beyond dualities as well as the experience of unity. 
knowing that there is nothing in reality to cling to or to push away. Thus it is ever fresh, vibrant, and just what works. Therefore, Manjusri's youthful appearance. From this heart comes a wise discernment that is very different from the decision-making that is the product of discriminatory thinking or merely intellectual functioning. Reverend Master Ji, you used to often, as you've many if you have heard perhaps talk about how the importance of how the, the to not allow our brains to be in charge of our lives and so much of our distress comes from um, being in this conundrum and that we have to through the training and through understanding the heart of Manjusri the heart or heart mind the shin becomes foremost and the brain then has its, finds its proper place. And she said it was rather like a computer. You know, you can make good use of it, turn it on when you need it, and it'll give you some information. It'll organize things for you and help you out when you need it. But if you have it run your life, it just wreaks havoc. And you're just constantly confused and, and distressed. I found that more often than not, this heart speaks, does speak in a soft voice. Sometimes called the still small voice, prompting us gently away from our harmful habit energies towards what is good and what really works in my experience. I remember a few significant occasions in my training. These things always stand out um, in hindsight. When I was feeling distressed, and perhaps inclined to do something daft or reacting simply from a habitual impulse, that that gentle voice prompted me just to sit still a little longer. I can still hear the words, Ando, just sit still a little longer. One is always deeply grateful for our training at such times. And I bow to Manjusri Bodhisattva for his guidance. Thankfully, I paid attention, and in fact, we've all paid attention to that at times, or we wouldn't be here today practicing together. And although the situations in which we have to do that are not easy, we're pointed to a place where we're no longer so caught up in the suffering. Great blessing. Thus we learn to live in the world as if in the sky, just as the lotus blossom is not wetted by the water that surrounds it, as our mealtime ending blessing says. I'd like to quote from one of Reverend Master Jiu's invocations that she wrote for the Manjusri Festival, which happens to be one of my all-time favorites. You who holds the sword of wisdom, true and bright. You who holds the book within our earthly sight. You pierce the deepest recesses of our minds so that peace from doubt we all may safely find. You whose golden body is seen in azure skies, Wearing five jeweled crown around blue lotus wreath, upon whose head great Aksubaya sits, that's one of the Buddhas, gently softening wisdom to cut through our distress. Hail to thee, the trainer of bodhisattvas. Hail to thee, the parent of many Buddhas. Thy wisdom doth teach us that we are truly free. There is liberation from all samsara's grief. Many years ago, I asked Reverend Master Jiu what was meant by wisdom in terms of a practice or a paramita. And she answered, it is the understanding that comes when there's a meeting with and knowing of the eternal, the truth of that which is through practice. 
I've since come to understand that it cannot be contained with the little human mind and that we are capable as human beings of entering into it and bringing it forth in our daily lives to benefit ourselves and others, albeit not as our personal, exclusive possession. So one way of looking at wisdom as a practice might be that of tuning in, tuning into that little, that still small voice, or just asking now and then, what's good to do here, and sitting with that. Of course, that is done within the context of taking refuge in the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, looking at the precepts, sometimes checking our little voice with others in the Sangha, lest we allow ourselves to become confused, which can happen. Nonetheless, it's a practice to learn to tune in. That wisdom is part of our true nature and is accessible to us when we really need it. It's not bound by or necessarily the result of scholarship or the study of worldly knowledge. Yet it does not stand against it and may make use of it in the service of the Buddha Dharma. I recently read a teaching on the eight states in which it is a Buddhist teaching on the eight states in which it is difficult for beings to see a Buddha, eight states of being or living or mind, in which it's difficult for them for us to see a Buddha or to practice the Buddha Dharma. One of them being the world in which one is constantly being entertained, which I thought was interesting, sounded a lot to me like um, our culture to some extent, where there's so much um, ability to uh, become entertained and seeking of entertainment. And another one of these um, eight states in which it's difficult for beings to practice is the world in which there is knowledge and competence. And I found that last one particularly interesting. Now, of course, we... We all deeply appreciate it when people are knowledgeable in their jobs, um, you know, when the, the, the surgeon knows how to do the, the operation well and he's paying attention. Um, competency we deeply appreciate and we're grateful for. The person who can come and fix our computer when we're trying desperately to finish a Dharma talk <laughs> or, um, you know, competence and knowledge are appreciated. But what this refers to is when that becomes foremost, when these qualities are considered foremost or all that matters, um, and that that is the, you know, the goal. One can really see the suffering of that world, and I certainly have experienced it myself, where a clinging to knowing and being good at everything can deaden what, the flow of compassion and wisdom. And certainly speaks to my perfectionistic um, tendencies. It's a good reminder. We have this aspect of our Western culture in particular of having to know and having to understand. And once we know, once we've got it down, everything's going to be fine. And Manjushri points us to letting go of even knowledge, making use of worldly knowledge, but not being stuck with it. So there's this flow through all of it, using when it's good to use, letting go when it's not necessary any longer. It's not the goal of training. I remember Reverend Master Jiu, when talking about bodhisattva activity, used to say that to the Buddhas and bodhisattvas, this world of samsara is a beautiful playground. Some of you have probably heard her say this. This always sounded lovely to me, but it didn't make much sense at first, to be honest. It always disturbed me a little. However, over the years, I've come to understand more of its meaning, and now a little of its deep meaning. Using this metaphor, she taught, the bodhisattvas, knowing for certain where their true home is, sitting within their lotus blossoms, are able to freely descend through the hollow stalk of the lotus to play in the mud of samsara, wherein are to be found beings that need help. 
they have a great advantage over those with whom they work and are not troubled by the seeming reality of what ordinary people call the sufferings of life. Now that's inspiring, isn't it? And as I understand it, they go back up the stalks when they need to also, going in and out, there being a cyclic flow to the practice. We have to enjoy the lotus for ourselves also, something that Reverend Master Jiu used to point out to me. This is a particularly helpful teaching in understanding uh, what it means to do bodhisattva training. So Manjushri shows us the Dharma door of how to sit in our true place within and allow the light of wisdom of our Buddha nature to shine through. We may get a bit muddy um, now and then in the course of our daily training, but it will never sully the unstained and pure source and in fact contains the light within itself. Koho Zenji taught Reverend Master that in order to train in Buddhism successfully, we must develop a kaleidoscopic mind, one that doesn't cling to anything or push anything away. It's the same thing. It just goes on and gets bigger and deeper and broader and embraces more. And there's a stillness always in the middle of it. Great Master Dogen, upon his return from his training in China in the 1200s, when he was asked what he'd found in his travels and his training there, he said, a flexible mind, a flexible mind heart. And I think that tells us something of Manjushri's great wisdom. The four wisdoms that are talked about as the signs of the four signs of enlightenment when we examine those, it's rather a different concept of what we might sometimes think of in Western culture and study, education as wisdom. Generosity, tenderness of speech, of heart, benevolence, finding skillful ways of helping beings, and sympathy. This is how wisdom expresses itself in our daily lives and in our interactions with others. Well, I'll end with a, a quote from Great Master Dagon, uh, Kazan, excuse me, Great Master Kazan in his Denkoroku, which is the record of the transmission of the light, uh, his teaching on, on the passing on of the Dharma in our lineage, writes in the chapter on the fifth ancestor. After Daitaka, which means understander of the truth, his name means that, after he heard his master's teaching, he sang a poem. Lofty mountain of seven treasures, from whence constantly gush out the plentiful waters of wisdom, changing into the real taste of truth. It does the best for everyone. Homage to all the Buddhas in all worlds. Homage to all the Bodhisattvas in all worlds. Homage to the scripture of great wisdom.